Why don't you turn and wave at somebody and greet them? Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I wonder if we could just take a few moments and begin to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this place. Let's give him a praise he's worthy of. Just open up your mouth and begin to praise his name. Jesus, we lift you up in this place, God. You're worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We're standing on your promise. We're 
of triumph right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm excited to be in the house of God this morning. Let's just all begin to raise our hands right now. God, we welcome you into this place, Lord. We just want to dwell in your presence this morning, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. There's nobody like you, Jesus. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are free. So let's start right now. Why
just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you.
him our highest praise right now. Make a joyful noise to the Lord right now. Lord, you're worthy. We give you the highest praise. Thank you, Jesus. God, you are more than enough for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. That's all right. Let's just praise him for another moment. Jesus, we lift up your name. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for diversity whenever it comes to our worship. We have the, the songs that have a lot of words and they say a lot of great things about God, but there's, there's something about the simple songs that just have a few words that you can just sing from your heart, that you can just lift up your voice and worship to him. Can we just worship him for another moment here this morning? Jesus, sometimes I just want to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for the, the presence of the Lord I feel in this place. Let's all stand together. We're going to go to him in prayer right now. We want to continue to remember um, uh, Senior Sister Bailey and um, uh, Pastor Smith and Sister Smith as they continue to recover. Let's continue to remember um, Chris and Rachel as well. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we want the, the healing right now. And sometimes it, it's a process. So we just have to trust God in the process. Amen. So let's just trust him today. Let's, let's pray that he would move in this place as well, that he's going to do something in this place. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity just to come into your house, to be with your people, to lift up your name, God. And we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us. Lord, today we ask that you would bless this time together, that you would touch each and every one of our hearts and our minds. Help us to grow in you today. Lord, I ask that you would touch these needs that we bring before you today, God. All those that are sick, all those that are afflicted, God, I pray that you would move and, and touch those situations. Touch Sister Bailey, touch uh, Pastor and Sister Smith. I pray that you would touch uh, Chris and Rachel, Lord, and all those that are still battling with sickness and illness, God. Lord, we're just trusting you to, to do a work that you would receive all the glory from it, that you could be lifted up and we could give you all glory and honor and praise. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together and thank him today. Hallelujah. Amen. We serve a mighty God. Amen. We're going to change things up just a little bit and dismiss all the kids. Ages 2 to 11 are going to go out these doors with Daniel. All right. Let's, let's give them a hand as they go this morning. You may be seated. How many of you are excited to be in church this morning? I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Let's just rejoice. Let's worship while we sing this song. Shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. You broke those chains, now I can lift my hands. And I'm going to praise you. Of my mind, I just can't seem to find the reason to believe that I can break free. Cause you see, I have been bound for so long, like all hope is gone. But as I lift my hands, I understand that I should praise them through my circumstance. Shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just wanna praise you, I just wanna praise you. You broke those chains, now I can lift my hands, and I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you Everything that could go wrong All went wrong at one time So much pressure fell on me I thought I was gonna lose my mind Well I know you wanna see If I can hold on through these trials Well I need you to lift this load Cause I can't take it no more Shackles off my feet so I can dance I just wanna praise you I just wanna praise you You broke those chains now I can live my hands and I'm gonna praise you I'm gonna praise you I've been through the fire and the rain down in every kind of way but God has broken every
every chain So let me go right now Shackles off my feet so I can dance So I can dance. I just wanna praise you. I just wanna praise you. You broke those chains, now I can lift my hands. And I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you. Take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just wanna praise you. I just wanna praise you. You broke those chains, now I can lift my hands. church today. Good to see everyone. Certainly, uh, we appreciate the presence of the Lord. Every time we come together, he's here. Amen. Amen. Every time we gather together in his name, he's here. I uh, just want to take a moment and remind everyone to be sure to bring your books with you on Wednesday night. We have a brand new format on Wednesday night. Uh, which is really exciting. I think everybody is enjoying this. Uh, everyone is breaking off into separate groups, going different places, but the adults are meeting over in the fellowship hall, and there we have coffee and tea and bottled water, that sort of thing, and it's a little more of a casual, um, informal gathering, but uh, I really believe that this uh, discipleship project that we're going through is something that everyone can benefit from, Everyone can grow from it, and uh, I just want to encourage those of you who have not uh, yet been in that to join us on Wednesday evening. It's going to be a good time. Then Thursday, we need all the men that we can get to come out. If we get enough guys to show up, uh, we can easily take care of this uh, in about an hour, maybe a little over an hour, but all the pews that you're sitting on right now are coming out, and it's the first phase of our uh, project renovation for the auditorium here and uh, so uh, we we have our chairs coming but they're not going to be here for a couple of weeks so next week you're going to have to stand throughout the entire service as the children of israel did when the word was read we're going to have some temporary solutions in place that will give you an opportunity to sit down. But uh, guys, we need you to help us out. We're demoing these pews and we're taking them out in pieces. And it will be um, uh, really helpful if, if right now, for me anyway, if the guys can be here at 6 o'clock. If you can't stay for an entire hour, come and do what you can do. Uh, but I encourage you to make the commitment and join us. Um, it's going to be at 6 o'clock, promptly 6 o'clock. But if you can't come till 6.30, show up whenever you can, all right? Uh, all the guys that can be here Thursday evening, would you please stand? I just need to get a general sense of who's going to be here. All right, thank you. God bless you. And um, we're going to, our, our new chairs won't be here. I talked to the uh, company on Thursday and they're not shipping out until next week so we're going to have a little bit of time here and please be patient with us as we uh, go through the steps of, of remodeling this room everything from ceiling to floor is going to be new it's all going to be really nice when it's all said and done um, but we did receive a little disappointing news uh, on Friday um, because of the pandemic, and Harold and, and Phil and those that are involved in uh, construction would affirm this, I'm sure, but because of the pandemic, materials are really getting hard uh, to get. Um, the, the company, the mills in Georgia were shut down for a period of time, pushing everything back. And what we thought was going to be uh, the first of May with our new carpet coming in, and the carpet that's, that's going to be uh, here on the main floor is going to be 
two by two carpet squares, um, they're not going to be able to be here till the first of July, which is disappointing because we had we thought all of our ducks in a row and everything ready to go. And I just called to confirm this past week, and they called me back on Friday and said, "Look, we're it's not it's out of our hands. Uh, we can't get the carpet in and." till the 1st of July. So just be patient. Uh, it is a process that we're doing in stages. The first stage is taking out the pews. They're coming um, a week from tomorrow to paint the ceiling. And uh, it's going to take them the entire week to do that because they're going to be making repairs to cracks that are in the ceiling and, and uh, some minor uh, fixes here and there. And then the ceiling is going to be painted. Once the ceiling is painted, the reason the pews have to come out is because uh, the, the labor involved in painting the ceiling was half what it would have been if the pews were left in place. With the pews gone, they can easily move around on scaffolding and do what they've got to do to uh, take care of the ceiling. So first stage, the pews, then the ceiling gets painted, and then we're going to start reconstructing uh, the platform area here. So everything is going to look really ugly for a while. Uh, for several weeks, actually, uh, but be patient with us. When it's all said and done, it's going to be a nice place. You just need to trust us and, and hang in there until we get it all done. And it looks like it's probably going to be uh, mid-July before everything is complete. That's not what I wanted, but I can't help that. So we'll, we'll do what we can do, and we'll still have church and still believe God for great things as we gather together in his name. Amen. I appreciate this congregation so very much. And I know many uh, in our church have gone through some hardships in recent months. Some have been very long uh, hardships. Some have gone from one thing to another. And I understand that life sometimes uh, is very complex, and it is very difficult to navigate through some of the things that we have to deal with that's just part of life. It's inevitable. We can't help uh, what happens as we age. We can't stop that. Wouldn't it be great if uh, Juan Ponce de Leon would have actually discovered the fountain of youth and we could have all got a big drink from there, live forever, but it's not, it's not, it's not true. God gave us a limited amount of time here on this earth. And um, no matter how long we're here, even if we live to be 100, 103, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, and he told me that his mother is 103 years old and lives alone and functions well and does great. Uh, he goes to his mother's home every day, checks on her, gets the newspaper for her, makes sure everything's in order for the day. And uh, he said that if she was put in a home, she'd probably die in a matter of days. Uh, but she loves being where she's at, and she's thriving at 103, which is pretty incredible. People are living longer, but we deal with life. I'm thankful that we have the body of Christ. I'm thankful for the church of the living God that we can actually go through life together. And we have one another for support and encouragement, but ultimately our dependence is upon God. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's with us every step of the way. He's never going to leave us, never going to forsake us, never put more upon us than what we're able to bear. Every day he loads us with benefits. We're just blessed, and I'm thankful that, that the Lord is in our lives. How? You know, the scripture says uh, in the first chapter of the book of Psalms, why does a heathen rage? Well, if you look around, without God, this world is a mess. It'd be hard to function, hard to live in this life without God. And having a relationship with God is paramount. That's the most important thing that any of us could possibly ever, ever do in our lives is to connect with him, walk in fellowship with him every single day. Because if we're out of step with God, all of our other relationships are going to be messed up. But when we're keeping him as a priority, seeking first the kingdom of God, then everything falls into place and we live this wonderful life, this abundant life that the Lord has, has promised to us. I appreciate you supporting me today as I share the word of God with you. Um, I was talking to a pastor, a uh, friend of mine a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me that a gentleman in his church told him, he said, you know, I wish you would be a little more fiery. 
And the pastor said to him, he said, that's ironic because I was just thinking the same thing about you. <laughs> Sometimes we, we want some type of a performance from the pulpit while we sit with our arms folded and our lips sealed. This is not, this is not a monologue. This is, this is a dialogue. This is something that we're all involved in here. You see, the Word of God is alive. You know, people go to ball games and they shout and they jump up and down. They get all excited about something that has absolutely no eternal value whatsoever. That is really, you know, 10, 15 years from now, nothing but a memory. But what we do here, connecting with the Lord, and I got to tell you, you miss out. When you don't make that connection, when the Word of God is being preached and, and, and you're not really connecting with it, it's not, going to, it's not going to benefit you like it would if you are in sync with the Spirit, allowing God's Word to be spoken into your life. And that's what makes the difference. And so uh, it's important. You know, T.F. Tinney said, when I teach, I tell. When I preach, I yell. But it's essentially the same thing. It's the Word of God, and it's what defines our lives. I'm thankful for the Word. How many are thankful for His Word today? Amen. Amen. So join with me today and help me preach the Word, and I trust that when everything is said and done here that uh, we're going to leave this place better than we were when we came. Why don't you stand with me, please, and I'm going to... Uh, direct your attention to the book of Psalm chapter 51. I know that probably most of you can quote portions of this chapter. It's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And it's really, when I read Psalm 51, I'm a little conflicted because there are places in this that are just really kind of sad because you see what sin can do to a person. And then there are places in it where I feel very thankful for what God has extended into our lives and what he's made available to us because none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We're, we're, we're living, uh, we're not living recklessly. We're not living haphazardly, but, but even though we're doing the best we can to observe God's word and to apply it to our daily lives from time to time, we're still going to be dealing with our flesh. We're still going to be dealing with the world. We're still going to be dealing with stuff that sometimes can cause us to mess up. Have you ever said something that you regretted saying or ever did something you think, oh man, I shouldn't have did that? Like the afternoon of Thanksgiving. I shouldn't have had three pieces of pumpkin pie. But God's word is, is, is amazing. Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. That's, that's the sad part. That's the sad part I'm talking about. My sin is always before me. Verse 4 says, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Before, behold, you desire the truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom." Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation, my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. 
for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Love this. I love this passage of Scripture. I love it. Today I want to preach to you or teach to you on the subject of accident forgiveness. Accident forgiveness. You may be seated. Anyone here ever had an accident and it was definitely your fault? Two of us? Three of us? Okay. Now we're getting honest. In 1996, I had an accident. It's the only accident that I've ever had. Uh, I've been involved in some accidents. As a matter of fact, a couple years ago, while I was sitting at the stoplight at 43rd and Scatterfield, a woman ran into the back of me, and uh, she was late for her heroin recovery program, and she wanted to leave the scene. She actually wanted to just, she said, I'll come back after I go through my, my meeting, and I said, you can't do that. I'm sorry, you can't leave the scene of an accident. I, I just had this suspicion that if she left, I'd never see her again. But in 1996, I was recovering from a surgery that I had, and I was on light duty from the fire department, and they had me assigned to the fire safety house at the Anderson Public Library. I was doing tours and and uh, teaching fire prevention programs to school children. And uh, it, it was enjoyable. I liked doing that, but it wasn't really my cup of tea. I, I loved firefighting. I loved being on the job. I loved doing uh, what I was trained to do. And um, so one afternoon, it was in January of 1996, a blinding snow. I mean, it was snowing, giant snowflakes. Uh, almost like a whiteout, and I was leaving the library in my truck, and I started to back out. I looked both directions. I didn't see anyone. I start to back out, and this car comes in behind me that I did not see, and I backed right into it. And that's the only accident that I've ever had that was my fault. I backed into this car. And so I was expecting after that event to receive notice in the mail that my insurance premiums were going to hang me out to dry. Uh, I, I went to the mailbox a, a few weeks later expecting this letter from my extortion company, or my insurance company. <laughs> and when I opened it, um, I discovered that there was this letter that essentially said, uh, we're sorry that you had an accident. Accidents do happen. Um, we're going to keep your premium the same. Just be more careful next time. And they said, this is accident forgiveness. Was that good news? Absolutely. That's exactly what many auto companies are doing nowadays. It's called accident forgiveness. If you have a new policy or you have a clean driving record for an extended period of time, uh, before any at-fault accident, meaning that you, have, that you have ran into someone or something, that fender bender probably isn't going to cost you a big hit on your insurance bill. For, for what has occurred here, um, at least this one time, it's, it's not going to go up. Accidents do happen out there on the road. And the assurance of insurance is a good thing, knowing that you're covered. It's a relief to get forgiveness when we probably don't deserve to be forgiven. If a big, impersonal insurance company can offer grace, imagine what kind of grace offers us when we have a moral crash in our lives. 
And what if that crash isn't an accident? What happens to us spiritually when our failure to stay on the road that God has set us on isn't an accident, but it's a willful, at-fault transgression? What kind of forgiveness, if any, can we expect? Well, there is a classic biblical test that is found in 2 Samuel 11 and, and, and chapter 11 and chapter 12 when King David viewed Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop. The impending collision in this adulterous affair was no mere fender bender in the eyes of God. His deception, his attempt to cover up and de facto murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, these are all evidence that David never tapped his ethical or spiritual breaks in this situation. His lust clouded his vision to the point that he swerved out of his own lane and head on into oncoming traffic, <clears throat> crashing in the same way that his spiritual ancestors Adam and Eve had done so many generations before. He preferred to listen to his own voice rather than the voice of God. And the result of that was tragic. I want to tell you today that it's popular in some circles these days to see sin as merely a mistake or accidents that reflect nothing more than human imperfections. Biblically speaking, however, sin is more often about a choice that we have made. God provides the law as a means of defining boundaries in our lives. And we choose whether or not to violate these boundaries at our own risk. Sin is not merely a legal violation of divine law like, like speeding or running a red light. The reason sin is so destructive, and hear me today, is because it breaks our relationship with God. And broken relationships aren't fixed simply by filling out paperwork or paying some fine. When we fail to maintain a right relationship with God, we need nothing less than a complete new beginning that God's grace and His mercy and His forgiveness provides for us. We need to be clear about what forgiveness is. I think sometimes we have some misconceptions when it comes to forgiveness. I recently came across a book. It's, it's been a few months ago, but it's written by Laron Schultz and Stephen Sandage. And it's called The Faces of Forgiveness. And they identify at least three different ways that we can define what forgiveness is. One definition is forensic forgiveness or legal forgiveness, the kind that your insurance company wants to give you or the kind that involves having a debt erased. The kind of forgiveness that is defined as this, transgressions in which one party agrees not to exact what the law requires. This kind of forgiveness is, is what we would call situational forgiveness. And it may be limited to just one particular event or one particular incident in our lives. Your insurance company forgives your momentary lapse in your driving skill. They, they, they call it accident forgiveness. For example, they won't raise your rates this time. But you back your car into your neighbor's mailbox next month, and you'll see that this whole 70 times 7 forgiveness thing that Jesus talked about isn't going to be written in your policy. They'll forgive you once, but you turn around and do it again and again and again, they're either going to raise your premiums or they're going to cancel you altogether. Legal forgiveness can often be a one-shot deal. And then when it comes to vehicular terms, habitual sin, even if it's unintentional, 
can be very, very expensive. A second definition of forgiveness connects with a therapeutic benefit. Forgiveness in this sense is a process by which the offended party is motivated to become less vengeful and, and more forgiving toward the wrongdoer. Forgiveness in this context does not condone the offense or it does not forget the offense. Forgiveness is about releasing claim over the offender in this particular therapeutic type of forgiveness that, that they define here. Forgiveness is not about what someone has done to you. Forgiveness is about you letting go. doesn't condone it. It doesn't cause you to forget it. It just simply says, I'm not going to be a prisoner to this any longer. I'm not going to let this define my life or control my thoughts, and I'm not going to be eaten up by this. I'm simply going to move forward. Sometimes the... The therapeutic type of forgiveness takes some time. It's a process that you have to kind of work through, and, and it's ongoing in many cases. Forgiveness is, is, is about legal definitions in certain, in certain things that we do in life, especially when it comes to the law, when it comes to your driving record, when it comes to your insurance, when it comes to other legal matters in your life. Forgiveness is about releasing claim over the offender and moving forward with your life. This is therapeutic forgiveness. It doesn't necessarily bring about reconciliation, and it doesn't bring about restoration of a broken relationship. That kind of of forgiveness requires a whole different level of forgiveness, the kind that only God can provide. Psalm 51 is essentially written uh, after the time in which David had his affair with Bathsheba. Uh, there were some biblical scholars that are of um, different opinions as to the timeline, how long it had been or how recent it had been uh, because of verse 18 where uh, David says rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Some believe that maybe it was written some time after the offense, but it doesn't really matter here. What is important is that David's heartfelt cry of this psalm certainly reflects a heart uh, that recognizes his failure. He recognizes his failure. You know, if you're ever going to get anywhere with God, you got to come clean. You can't hide your sin, Aiken, and get by with it. It will cost you something. And what we see here in the life of David is he's, he's acknowledging this. He's coming clean before God. He's, he's not looking for a hall pass. He's not looking for a mistake uh, to be, era to be um, uh, omitted as far as uh, from memory or that, you know, it, it, ignoring that it happened. David's coming clean. He's saying, I did this. I did this to you, God. I, I, I committed this sin. And he's not wanting God to withhold righteousness or, 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 or anger and judgment while uh, he goes one way and God goes another way. David is seeking nothing less and this is really important because this is the gist of Psalm 51. He's seeking nothing less than total restoration of the most important relationship in his entire life, and that is his relationship with God. He was seeking what Schultz and Sandage define as redemptive forgiveness. Redemptive forgiveness. When David was confronted by the prophet Nathan in, in 2 Samuel, David comes to this heartbreaking realization that sin that he committed was against God. And it's echoed throughout Psalm 51. That doesn't somehow uh, take away the hurt that he caused other people that were involved in his sin. Because every time we sin, it affects other people. We say, well, you know, it, 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 it's 
something I did. It's not about anyone else. Oh, it's always about someone else. Because our influence is far more reaching than what we think. And when we live our lives recklessly with no regard and we make stupid choices, we're affecting other people. We're going to affect our spouse. We're going to affect our children. We're going to affect uh, people that we know, our friends. That's the reason why it's important for us to be very deliberate about how we live. The choices that we make need to be intentional. We need to make sure that we are living within the parameters of God's word. The whole purpose that God gave to us, the law, was so that we could live a life, not just that pleased him, but a life that would be free from the heartache and the pain that sin brings. <laughs> Certainly the guilt-ridden uh, effects of sin that, that are very long-term. And sometimes uh, people that we've hurt forgive us and and certainly God forgives us but the biggest struggle that many people have is forgiving themselves they feel that guilt they feel that shame they feel how how could I put myself in this situation why did I let this happen in my life I I was not thinking I was blinded I was I was overwhelmed by by my circumstances and I never really thought about the the far-reaching consequences that that were involved here so it always affects other people. What David was saying here in Psalm 51 is a recognition that all sin moves us away from God. That it puts distance between us and God. The psalm then is focusing on the steps that he's taking to seek restoration and reconciliation with God. Counting on what verse 1 says, God's steadfast love and mercy to restore this broken relationship. Listen, your insurance company has a long memory when it comes to your, uh, your driving. The psalmist asked God to not just forgive this one incident that he had, this, this terrible lapse of judgment, but to wipe his slate clean altogether. And this is the difference between uh, the good hands people and the hand of God. The insurance company, it looks at your driving record, whether it's good or whether it's bad. God does not look at your record. He knows that it's already bad. He knows us. That's why his plea to blot out my transgressions is so very, very important. Listen, God forgives God forgives. God forgives. And I'm thankful for it. I'm so thankful that, that the Lord does not discard us and eliminate us from any possibility of having a relationship restored with Him. God, it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter when we've done it. It doesn't matter how far we go away from God. His hand of mercy can still reach us. He's, his, his, his mercy and His grace is still following us. All the days of our lives. Does that mean that I have a license to sin? That I can do whatever I want to do? That I can live intentionally going out here and, and violating God's law or going against God's word? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But if I make bad choices and if I make serious mistakes in my life, God's mercy and his grace is extended. And after repeated references is, uh, here to cleansing uh, here in Psalm 51, we find evidence of the assurance that God's redemptive forgiveness extends far beyond our last sinful act. Your insurance company has a long memory when it comes to the last time that you ran off the road and hit a mailbox or accidentally bumped into someone sitting at a stoplight. The psalmist asked God to not just forgive this, this one incident, but to wipe the slate clean. When we come to God in confession, 
When we come to God in repentance, we know that God's primary concern is to reconcile the relationship. That's what God wants. And it's certainly something that we should want as well. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is no divine claims adjuster who raises the cost of our sin with each incident, but instead, God will hide. It says in verse 9, hide God's face from our sins. They are dumped in the circular file and deleted from the database. Like David, we still have to deal with the consequences of our action, but God promises that we won't have to carry the guilt of it anymore. This cloud of shame that hangs low over our heads, we don't have to live that way. The enemy likes to place condemnation upon us and make us feel like, you know, there's absolutely no way we can get back to God, that we've just messed up too many times or we've messed up too severely for God to ever forgive us. But that's, that's a lie from the enemy. That's, that's his, his tactic to try to keep us from, from ever making an effort to get back to God. Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now... No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Aren't you thankful for that? Paul goes on to say, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Listen to this. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We have to recognize, however, that the purpose of God's forgiveness is, is not just simple absolution waiting for the next sin or the next time we mess up. Redemptive Forgiveness is about clearing the way for a renewed relationship with him. A relationship where the joy of God's salvation wins out over self-serving pleasures of sin. And sin is pleasurable. People wouldn't sin if it wasn't pleasurable. The Bible talks about the pleasures of sin. But we receive God's grace and we do so not as a license to sin, just simply knowing that we're going to be forgiven. God's grace and God's forgiveness are about a transformation, a metamorphosis, where we're moving away from our flesh and we're moving into a life in the spirit, where our lives and our heart is being changed by God, a willing spirit, a broken spirit that recognizes a constant dependence upon God. Listen, I can't make it without him. You can't make it without him. You merely exist. And what pleasures that sin brings into your life are very short term. They don't last long. And then you've got to get the next high, the next fix, the next thing that that somehow brings temporary satisfaction and you can go from one to another to another to another. But God changes our hearts if we'll allow him. And that's what is, is so defined here in Psalm 51. David wants change. 
He doesn't want to remain in that condition. He's asking God, forgive me, blot out my transgressions. He's not wanting to live with that guilt. He's wanting a transformation. Redemptive forgiveness enables us to move in a new direction, away from sin, where sin is no longer in the driver's seat, but God is now in control. We're submitting to his authority. We're allowing God to rule our hearts. And I want to tell you that now, today, it's the perfect time to knock out all the dents and all the dings that were received as a result of our reckless living. Today's the day where we need to apply Psalm 51 to our lives. It's the day that we need to come to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Why don't you stand with me, please? We're all born in sin. Shaping in iniquity. None of us are perfect. The only one that was perfect was crucified. The Bible says it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear that we shall be like him. for We shall see him as he is. Until that time we're dealing with the imperfection of our flesh, of our old carnal nature, of our old man. And from time to time, it rears its ugly head. And that's why it's important for us to die daily, crucify our flesh, bring our old nature under subjection to the Spirit every day of our lives. You see, coming to the Lord and experiencing Him in salvation is just not a one-time thing. The Scripture talks about how His Spirit, or excuse me, how His blood constantly is cleansing us from all unrighteousness and sin. Constantly. It's like the blood that circulates through your body. It's taking impurities out of your body, flushing those impurities so that your blood is healthy and pure. It's amazing how God designed our bodies to function. It's amazing what the blood does in us naturally. And it's even more amazing what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us spiritually. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now, today, is the time to humbly place God in the driver's seat and to work on the disciplines that help us grow in our relationship with God. It's time for confession. It's time for repentance, for asking God to redeem us. It's also a time for us to, to offer forgiveness to others if we're harboring things in our heart that shouldn't be. Say, well, you don't know what they did. You don't know how badly they hurt me. It doesn't matter. You can't live with that unforgiveness in your life. You're, 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 you're a prisoner to that. And today's a perfect opportunity for you to just say, you know, I'm going to rid myself of that. I'm going to, I'm going to extend forgiveness. Does it erase what happened? It doesn't say it didn't occur, but you're letting go. And you're going to move forward with your life. God's grace is not a one-shot deal, but it's offered for a lifetime to you and I. First John, my last scripture for you today, please receive this. 1 John 2 and 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. In other words, you need to live your life on purpose. But he goes on to say, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's not like some police officer that's ready to impose every penalty he can upon you. He wants you to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And I think today, right now, is a perfect time. I don't care whether there's anything happening in your life that shouldn't be or not. Today's a perfect time to repent. Today's a perfect time to forgive. Today's a perfect time to receive God's mercy and his grace into our lives. And I'm going to ask you, I know we're moving forward and, 
and getting back to what we know is normal. Uh, and I know also I'm aware that some people are still a little uncomfortable with crowds. But I'm going to invite you to join me around this altar. Just keep some distance between yourself and others. But please, I'd like for all of us to take some time. As a matter of fact, I think we need to allow at least 15 minutes so that we can monitor your condition to see whether or not you have a reaction to this message today. <laughs> and if you're okay after that, then you'll be free to go. All right? But let's spend some time with the Lord. If nothing else, if everything's hunky-dory in your life, why don't you spend some time with him at this altar today and say, Lord, I'm so thankful that you forgive me of my sins. I'm so thankful that you still love me. I'm so thankful that you have not thrown me away. I love you, Lord. Why don't you join me? Let's come right now.